I would like to welcome um, Bill Kelly. Bill Kelly is going to talk to us about um, diet and exercise. Bill is one of our exercise physiologi physio physiologists at Celebration uh, at our hospital and is going to enlighten us with that, in that respect. First of all, the concept, let me see if it turns. Not an entirely new concept. Plato was given the quote, lack of activity destroys good condition of every human being, while movement and methodical physical exercise save and preserve it. Hippocrates, our food should be our medicine, our medicine should be our food. More recently, more recently, the World Cancer Research Fund and the uh, in the American Institute for Cancer Research in 2007 came up with the statement that most cancers they feel are between 30 to 50 percent preventable over time by appropriate food, nutrition, regular physical activity, and the avoidance of obedience, or obesity, sorry about that. Reg <laughs> Just thinking about something else there for a while. Regular physical activity is associated with overall, now this is very important, this was just published in January 2011. This was a study of about 3,500 patients and it was looking at prostate cancer specifically. And not only was regular physical activity associated with uh, an increased survival benefit, well that's to be expected because most prostate patients are, are you get that later on in age, but also was identified as prostate-specific survival benefit. So this is the first time that they've seen specific evidence regarding exercise and prostate-specific survival rates. So that was, that was pretty good news. Okay, well, how does obesity, physical activity, food influence cancer growth? And again, a lot of this, I think you're going to see more as we go on. This is based on random clinical trials. So everything has to be in a row, and there's a number of factors. But there does seem to be some clear evidence that uh, high body fat, calorie dense, low nutrition food, as well as low physical activity can contribute to cancer growth. So when we kind of look at this, I'm not an expert on cancer, but cancer cells can display some of these following characteristics. And as we go look at those, and we look at the effects of malnutrition, we look at the effects of, of exercise, and we look at the effects of obesity, you can see where there might be some relationships. Okay, cancer, cells become cancerous because of damaged DNA for one reason or another. Damaged cells become, then become self-sufficient in growth. They become insensitive to the body's self-protection mechanisms and anti-growth signals. They start to evade cellular suicide. They start developing the capacity for limitless reproduction. 
They develop the capacity to introduce new blood sources, and they have the ability to mat metastasize into other tissues. Okay, well let's look at excess body fat's role in the development of cancer and reoccurrence in patients. Okay, excess body fat contributes to insulin resistance. As a person becomes more insulin resistant, the body's response to that is inflammation. Inflammatory response can lead to damaged DNA, and that can lead to a condition called metabolic inflexibility. So once a person is obese, has excess body fat, they start becoming more of a muscle burning, fat storing machine, and all this kind of cascades into resulting into abnormal cell defects, decreased ability to the body to self-regulate cellular damage, and, uh, and it also triggers a greater chance of triggering latent cancer cells in survivors. So the panel's recommendation from this 2007 uh, meeting was be as lean as possible within the normal range of body weight. Maintenance of a healthy weight throughout life may be one of the most important ways to protect against cancer, period and aim towards staying within the normal BMI range and trying to avoid weight gain and waist circumference gain throughout adulthood. Okay, umbilical is kind of a field measure for, uh, for insulin resistance. So men that have a, 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 a circumference around the umbilical of 40, 40 inches or greater are at much more risk or probably to some degree already insulin resistance. Women, it's 35 inches. Okay. Hormones produced by belly fat tend to lead to overproduction of insulin, insulin-like growth factors, both of which potential stimulants for cancer cell growth. BMI recommendations for prostate cancer, trying to have the BMI below 25. BMI looks at your height and weight. There's a standard chart in any physician's office in there. And we want body fat. Remember, body fat is not really captured by the BMI. Body fat, we'd like under 25%. What's nutrition's role in cancer development and cancer reoccurrence? Well, some of the same things. Good nutrition can help lower inflammation rates. And we'll talk about what is good nutrition. It can help stabilize insulin rates help facilitate DNA repair by providing essential nutrients to the cells, and can help maintain lean body mass, preserve muscle tissue, and can help maintain a healthy weight. By providing the body with essential nutrients and limiting calorie-dense, nutrient-rich food, you're providing environment to help repair that damp cellular damaged DNA you're providing environment to help maintain muscle mass and to limit excess body fat from accumulating. And the panel recommendations, again, this was mentioned earlier, is have a diet high in plant foods, uh, eat mostly foods of plant origin, at least five portions of servings of a variety of different colors of foods for the antioxidants and phytonutrients in there every day. Try to eat unprocessed cereals, whole grains, and uh, pulses with every meal or legumes, limit refined or processed food, and about 80 percent, about 80 percent of the Americans only get about one to two servings of fruits and vegetables a day in there. Okay, food, now this is, there it does seem to be some strong evidence with uh, li uh, lipocaine. That's found in the red pigment of fruits and vegetables in there. And what it's been shown to do, strong evidence base. If you look at the bottom of that slide, this would, they have based evidence on no correlation, limited correlation, strong evidence, okay? With this nutrient, there's strong evidence that it has a positive effect in the prevention and the reduction of aggressive prostate cancer. Okay, it's best absorbed for, through fruits and vegetables that have been cooked, where, it, where the nutrient can be released in there. And tomato-based sauces are probably one of the best sources of this nutrient. Foods that fight cancer, legumes, beans, peanuts, peas, lentils, and soy. They're high in protein, high in folate, B vitamins, fiber, and antioxidants. They help stabilize blood sugar levels with the high fiber content. 
they help reduce inflammation, and they have a prebiotic effect in the intestines. Okay? Foods that also fight cancer, omega-3 fatty acids. Most of our nutrients, there's two essential families of, of essential fatty acids that our body needs, omega-6s and omega-3s. There's some controversy, but the school of thought seems to be we get way more omega-6s than omega-3s. Omega-6s seem to contribute to inflammation, where omega-3s provide a balance of that. We should be somewhere in the vicinity of a 2 to 1 ratio. Most Americans are in the vicinity of about a 20 to 1 ratio. So eating a diet rich in omega-3s or taking a supplement fish oil with that of about 1,000 milligrams a day would be recommended. Again, the jury's still out whether that's strong recommendation, but that's a general health recommendation. Okay, and also whole grains versus processed grains. Whole grains help stabilize insulin levels, they provide antioxidants, and they also provide healthy gut bacteria versus your processed grains. A lot of the processing eliminates most of the fiber, vitamins, phytonutrients, and minerals out of the food. So the panel's recommendation for food and drinks that promote uh, weight gain. You want to limit consumption of calorie-dense foods and avoid sugary drinks. Consume energy-dense foods sparingly. Energy-dense foods, high-calorie, low-nutrient foods, aka processed foods. Avoid sugary drinks, soda, juice, energy drinks. Consume fast foods sparingly, if at all. Foods that promote cancer growth, sugar, processed carbohydrates, we already discussed. Okay, sugar is the primary source for many cancers, stimulates insulin production, linked with the increased risk of diabetes and heart disease. Okay, also processed meat, saturated fat, and trans fat. The diet on meat, red meat in general, is still out. But processed meat contains high fat content and nitrates. Uh, nitrates. They've been linked as a carcinogenic agent in most cancers. Uh, also, saturated fat and trans fat increases low-density lipoprotein scores, decreases HDL scores, and increases triglyceride levels. Okay, panel recommendations. Consume less than 18 ounces per week of red meat, very little if any processed. Saturated fat should be less than 10% of total calorie consumption throughout the day. Foods that promote prostate cancer, milk and dairy. Milk and dairy are still out, although very strong recommendation. Again, it looks like uh, diets that are high in calcium probably do contribute to the formation of prostate cancer. So, that would be something you wanted to avoid. Not calcium in general, but high calcium diets of about over 2,000 milligrams per day. Okay, and that's uh, the recommendation. Okay, nutrition recommendations for prostate cancer survivors. Fish two to three times per week or supplement with uh, greater than 1,000 milligrams per day of fish oil. Tomato products, especially sauces, two to three times per week. Fruits and vegetables, five per day, at least three non-starchy vegetables and two fruits. Legumes daily, whole grains daily, replace vegetable oils with uh, extra virgin olive oil and green tea daily. Foods to avoid, high fructose corn syrup and processed food. Trans fat and limit saturated fat. Meat that is grilled, that is overcooked, grilled or fried and high calcium intakes of over 2,000 milligrams. Now, exercise is rolled. Now, somebody was saying they didn't like exercise. That is completely crazy. They must not have been doing it right. Increased fat oxidation exercise helps. It helps increase insulin sensitivity. So again, you're seeing some of the same repeats in this. Improved cellular uh, adiposis or cell death antioxidant function. Okay, when you put all these together, again, we're decreasing inflammation, we're improving cell death, we're improving in the body's ability to repair damaged DNA, not to mention some of the other effects. Some of the other effects is higher intensity exercise improves cardiovascular function, improves skeletal muscle, enhances synovial fluid or your lubricant in your joints, helps you move better. You don't move, joints stiffen up. 
improves anxiety and depression, and helps maintain a healthy weight. Now, this is also kind of important. Remember, prostate cancer starts later in life. So very often, heart disease, diabetes, depression, and other uh, and weight gain often occur with a sedentary lifestyle, and that can be compounded with the diagnosis of cancer. You get a bad diagnosis, what do most people want to do? They want to have comfort food. Comfort increases serotonin in the brain. Serotonin makes you feel good, but you're feeding the very thing that could potentially grow your cancer. Panel recommendations for physical activity. Now, this is fairly new. Before, just like with cardiovascular patients, it's rest, take care of yourself, let the body heal itself. Now what they're saying is the number one recommendation, be as physically active as possible. Avoid inactivity. Okay? Being moderately physically active, brisk walking for at least 30 minutes per day. As fitness improves, aim for 60 minutes or more of moderate or 30 minutes or more of vigorous physical activity. Limit sedentary activities such as watching television. Okay, and this one, I'm going to play on that last thing. Avoid, inact uh, avoid inactivity, increase need. Non-exercise activity time. A study was released in the Wall Street Journal at the beginning of this year and was talking about even when we have exercise people that do it on a regular basis, if you're sitting in front of a computer or in front of a television set for any prolonged period of time, fat oxidation slows down tremendously. So the answer wasn't to quit your job or to quit what you did, but was to include more movement in the day. So it didn't have to necessarily be structured exercise. Use a pedometer. 5,000 steps a day denotes an active lifestyle. There's additional benefits up to about 12,000, but you're not going to hit 12,000 just walking to the car and to the store. You're going to have to incorporate a daily walk. But if I see people, patients all the time when I'm talking to them, and we want to know what they're getting at. Well, I exercise three times a week. Well, that's good, but are you even at an active lifestyle? Do you even qualify on the radar screen? So that's my first criteria. Do we have an active lifestyle in there? And then once we have an active lifestyle, we can start developing habits and go from there. Higher intensity exercise provides greater benefits. Walking doesn't generally increase the heart rate or provide too much benefits for muscle mass unless the person's extremely sedentary. So when you look at perceived exertion, the higher the increase in exertion, the more physiological benefits that are associated with it. Strength training, now more than ever, you start losing muscle mass, ripe old age of about 25. That decreases with age. It can be uh, modified with uh, with strength training, can't be, uh, it can't be completely canceled out. Muscle tissue more, burns more calories than fat. It helps the body become more insulin or sensitive. The more muscle you have, the more sensitive to insulin. Helps your immune system function more efficiently. Exercise recommendations, avoid inactivity. 150 minutes per week moderate intense exercise or 75 minutes per week of vigorous exercise. And again, that report that I referenced earlier, I, be, I think it was the physician's follow-up, they actually showed that higher intensity exercise of about 200 to 250 minutes a week actually provided better outcomes with prostate-specific cancers. Strength training, two to three times a week, eight to 10 exercises, 10 to 15 repetitions per set. That's kind of important. Patients tell me they watch TV and they just sit there and they're doing dumbbell curls and they say, I'm doing strength training. And I said, well, technically, but not really. Okay, return to normal activity as quickly as possible. Target 5,000 steps per day on average. Limit television and other sedentary behavior. Contraindications, recovery from surgery. You have to allow the body to recover from surgery before you push it extreme uh, anemia or ataxia, and general guidelines on cardiovascular pulmonary issues. Special considerations, prostate cancer, looking at fracture, osteoporosis, osteopenia concerns, pelvic floor exercises, putting the pieces together. Okay, obesity, high calorie, low nutrient diet, and, ins and inactivity lead to DNA damage insulin resistance, inflammation, fatigue, and degenerative disease. Whereas healthy body fat, 
well-balanced diet, nutrient replete, active lifestyle, high physical fitness level, helps the body repair damaged DNA, and does the reverse of the above in there, and also decreases your incidence of degenerative disease. And these are just some other resources, and thank you for your time.